back to the Fourth Way Podcast. Today, I am going to be reading the second chapter of Walter Wink's Jesus and Nonviolence, A Third Way, with permission of Fortress Press. As usual, at the end, I will provide you with some of my reflections on the, the work. Enjoy. Many of those who have committed their lives to ending injustice simply dismiss Jesus' teachings about nonviolence out of hand as impractical idealism, and with good reason. Turn the other cheek suggests the passive, Christian doormat quality that has made so many Christians cowardly and complicit in the face of injustice. Resist not evil seems to break the back of all opposition to evil and to counsel submission. Going the second mile has become a platitude, meaning nothing more than extend yourself and rather than fostering structural change, encourages collaboration with the oppressor. Jesus obviously never behaved in any of these ways. Whatever the source of the misunderstanding, it is clearly in neither Jesus nor his teaching, which, when given a fair hearing in its original social context, is arguably one of the most revolutionary political statements ever uttered. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Matthew 5, 38-41 When the court translators working in the hire of King James chose to translate antistenai as resist no evil, They were doing something more than rendering Greek into English. They were translating nonviolent resistance into docility. Jesus did not tell his oppressed hearers not to resist evil. That would have been absurd. His entire ministry is utterly at odds with such a preposterous idea. The Greek word is made up of two parts, anti, a word still used in English for against, and histemi, a verb that, in its noun form, stasis, means violent rebellion, armed revolt, sharp dissension. In the Greek Old Testament, antistenai is used primarily for military encounters, 44 out of 71 times. It refers specifically to the moment two armies collide, steel on steel, until one side breaks and flees. In the New Testament, it describes Barabbas, a rebel who had committed murder in the insurrection, and the townspeople in Ephesus, who are in danger of being charged with rioting. The term generally refers to a potentially lethal disturbance or armed revolution. A proper translation of Jesus' teaching would then be, don't strike back at evil, or one who has done you evil, in kind. Do not retaliate against violence with violence. The scholar's version is brilliant. Don't react violently against the one who is evil. Jesus was no less committed to opposing evil than the anti-Roman resistance fighters. The only difference was over the means to be used, how one should fight evil. There are three general responses to evil. One, passivity. Two, a violent opposition. And three, the third way of militant nonviolence articulated by Jesus. Human evolution has conditioned us for only the first two of these responses, flight or fight. Fight had been the cry of Galileans who had abortively rebelled against Rome only two decades before Jesus spoke. Jesus and many of his hearers would have seen some of the 2,000 of their countrymen crucified by the Romans along the roadside. They would have known some of the inhabitants of Sephoris, a mere three miles north of Nazareth who had been sold into slavery for aiding the insurrectionists' assault on the arsenal there. Some also would live to experience the horrors of the war against Rome in 66-70 to CE, one of the ghastliest in human history. If the option fight had no appeal to them, their only alternative was flight, passivity, submission, or at best a passive-aggressive recalcitrance in obeying commands. For them, no third way existed. Submission or revolt spelled out the entire vocabulary of their alternatives to oppression. Now we are in a better position to see why King James's faithful scholars translated antistenai as resist not. 
the king would not want people concluding that they had any recourse against his or any other sovereign's unjust policies. Therefore, the populace must be made to believe that there are two alternatives, and only two, fight or flight. Either we resist not, or we resist. And Jesus commands us, according to these king's men, to resist not. Jesus appears to authorize monarchical absolutism. Submission is the will of God, and most modern translations have meekly followed in the path. Neither of these alternatives has anything to do with what Jesus is proposing. It is important that we be utterly clear about this point before we go on. Jesus abhors both passivity and violence as responses to evil. His is a third alternative not even touched by these options. Antistheni cannot be construed as uh, to mean submission. Jesus clarifies his meaning by three brief examples. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Why the right cheek? How does one strike another on the right cheek anyway? Try it. A blow by the right fist in that right-handed world would land on the left cheek of the opponent. To strike the right cheek with the fist would require using the left hand, but in a society, the left hand was used only for unclean tasks. Even to gesture with the left hand at Qumran carried the penalty of exclusion and ten days' penance. The only way one could strike the right cheek with the right hand would be with the back of the right hand. What we are dealing with here is unmistakably an insult, not a fist fight. The intention is not to injure but to humiliate, to put someone in his or her place. One normally did not strike a peer thus, and if one did, the fine was exorbitant. Four zoos was the fine for a blow to a peer with a fist, four hundred zoos for backhanding him, but to an underling, no penalty whatsoever. In the Mishnah, Baba Kama, 8, 1 through 6. A backhand slap was the normal way of admonishing inferiors. Masters backhanded slaves, husbands, wives, parents, children, men, women, Romans, Jews. We have here a set of unequal relations in each of which retaliation would be suicidal. The only normal response would be cowering submission. It is important to ask who Jesus' audience is. In every case, Jesus' listeners are not those who strike, initiate lawsuits, or impose forced labor, but their victims. If anyone strikes you, would sue you, forces you to go one mile. There are among his hearers people who were subjected to these very indignities, forced to stifle their inner outrage at the dehumanizing treatment meted out to them by the hierarchical system of caste and class, race and gender, age and status, and as a result of imperial occupation. Why then does he counsel the already humiliated people to turn the other cheek? Because this action robs the oppressor of the power to humiliate. The person who turns the other cheek is saying, in effect, try again. Your first blow failed to achieve its intended effect. I deny you the power to humiliate me. I am a human being just like you. Your status does not alter that fact. You cannot demean me. Such a response would create enormous difficulties for the striker. Purely logistically, what can he do? He cannot use the backhand because his nose is in the way. He can't use his left hand regardless. If he hits with a fist, he makes himself an equal, acknowledging the other as a peer. But the whole point of the back of the hand is to reinforce the caste system and its institutionalized inequality. Even if he orders the person flogged, the point has been irrevocably made. The oppressor has been forced, against his will, to regard this subordinate as an equal human being. The powerful person has been stripped of his power to dehumanize the other. This response, far from admonishing passivity and cowardice, is an act of defiance. The second example Jesus gave is set in a court of law. Someone is being sued for his outer garment. Who would do that? And under what circumstances? The Old Testament provides the clues. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not go into his house to fetch his pledge. You shall stand outside, and the man to whom you make the loan shall bring the pledge out to you. And, if he is a poor man, you shall not sleep in his pledge. When the sun goes down, you shall restore to him the pledge that he may sleep in his cloak and bless you. You shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. 
Only the poorest of the poor would have nothing but an outer garment to give as collateral for a loan. Jewish law strictly required its return every evening at sunset, for that was all the poor had in which to sleep. The situation Jesus alludes to is one with which all the hearers would have been all too familiar. The poor debtor has sunk ever deeper into poverty. The debt cannot be repaid, and his creditor has hauled him into court to try to seize his property by legal means. Indebtedness was the most serious social problem in first century Palestine. Jesus' parables are full of debtors struggling to salvage their lives. The situation was not, however, a natural calamity that had overtaken the incompetent. It was the direct consequence of Roman imperial policy. Emperors taxed the wealthy ruthlessly to fund their wars. Naturally, the rich sought non-liquid investments to secure their wealth. Land was best. But there was a problem. It was not bought and sold on the open market as today, but was ancestrally owned and passed down over generations. Little land was ever for sale, in Palestine at least. Exorbitant interest, however, could be used to drive land over owners into ever deeper debt until they were forced to sell their land. By the time of Jesus, we see this process already far advanced. Large estates, owned by absentee landlords, managed by stewards, and worked by servants, sharecroppers, and day laborers. It is no accident that the first act of the Jewish revolutionaries in 66 CE was to burn the temple treasury where the record of debts was kept. It is in this context that Jesus speaks. His hearers are the poor. If anyone would sue you, they share a rankling hatred for a system that subjects them to humiliation by stripping them of their lands, their goods, and finally, even their outer garments. Why then does Jesus counsel them to give over their inner garment as well? This would mean stripping off all their clothing and marching out of court stark naked. Put yourself in the debtor's place and imagine the chuckles this saying must have evoked. There stands the creditor, beat red with embarrassment. Your outer garment in one hand, your underwear in the other. You have suddenly turned the tables on him. You had no hope of winning the trial. The law was entirely in his favor but you have refused to be humiliated. And, at the same time, you have registered a stunning protest against a system that spawns such debt. You have said, in effect, you want my robe? Here, take everything. Now, you've got all I have except my body. Is that what you'll take next? Nakedness was taboo in Judaism, and shame fell not on the naked party, but on the person viewing or causing one's nakedness. By stripping, you have brought the creditor under the same prohibition that led to the curse of Canaan. As you parade into the street, your friends and neighbors, startled, aghast, inquire what happened. You explain. They join your growing procession, which now resembles a victory parade. The entire system by which debtors are oppressed has been publicly unmasked. The creditor is revealed to be not a respectable moneylender, but a party in the reduction of an entire social class to landlessness and destitution. This unmasking is not simply punitive, however. It offers the creditor a chance to see, perhaps for the first time in his life, what his practice has caused, and to repent. Far from collaborating in injustice, the poor man has used the law, Aikido-like, to make an exploitative law a laughingstock. Jesus, in effect, is sponsoring clowning. In so doing, he carries on a venerable tradition in Judaism. As a later saying of the Talmud runs, if your neighbor calls you an ass, put a saddle on your back. The powers that be literally stand on their dignity. Nothing depotentates them faster than uh, deft lampooning. By refusing to be awed by their power, the powerless are emboldened to seize the initiative, even where structural change is not possible. This message far from being a counsel of perfection unattainable in this life, is a practical strategic measure for empowering the oppressed. It provides a hint of how to take on the entire system in a way that unmasks its essential cruelty and to burlesque its pretensions to justice, law, and order. Here is a poor man who will no longer be treated as a sponge to be squeezed dry by the rich. He accepts the laws as they stand, pushes them to the point of absurdity, and reveals them for what they really are. He strips nude, 
walks out before his compatriots, and leaves the creditor and the whole economic edifice he represents stark naked. Under the apartheid regime in South Africa, the authorities had, for a long time, sought a way to destroy a particular shanty town without success. Then one day, after most of the men and women had left for work, the army arrived. The soldiers announced that the few women there had five minutes to gather their things, and then the bulldozers would commence to work. The women, perhaps sensing the prudery of the farm boys who largely made up the army, stood in front of the bulldozers and stripped off all their clothes. The army fled. Was Johann Strouder, the renegade South African nationalist businessman, thinking of this passage? Or was he just fed up when he removed his trousers in front of the Port Elizabeth City Hall in April of 1986 when demonstrating against apartheid? Jesus' third example, the one about going the second mile, is drawn from the very enlightened practice of limiting the amount of forced labor that Roman soldiers could levy on subject peoples. Jews would have seldom encountered legionnaires except in times of war or insurrection. It would have been auxiliaries who were headquartered in Judea, paid at half the rate of legionnaires and rather a scruffy bunch. In Galilee, Herod Antipas maintained an army patterned after Rome's. Presumably, it also had the right to impose labor. Mile markers were placed regularly beside the highways. A soldier could impress a civilian to carry his pack one mile only. To force the civilian to go farther carried with it severe penalties under military law. In this way, Rome attempted to limit the anger of the occupied people and still keep its armies on the move. Nevertheless, this levy was a bitter reminder to the Jews that they were a subject people, even in the Promised Land. To this proud but subjugated people, Jesus does not counsel revolt. One does not befriend the soldier, draw him aside, and drive a knife into his ribs. Jesus was keenly aware of the futility of our armed revolt against Roman imperial might, and minced no words about it, though it must have cost him support from the revolutionary factions. But why walk the second mile? Is this not to rebound to the opposite extreme? Aiding and abetting the enemy? Not at all. The question here, as in the two previous instances, is how the oppressed can recover the initiative, how they can assert their human dignity in a situation that cannot, for the time being, be changed. The rules are Caesar's, but not how one responds to the rules. That is God's, and Caesar has no power over that. Imagine, then, the soldier's surprise when, at the next mile marker, he reluctantly reaches to assume his pack. 65 to 85 pounds in full gear, and you say, Oh no, let me carry it another mile. Why would you do that? What are you up to? Normally, he has to coerce your kinsman to carry his pack, and now you do it cheerfully and will not stop. Is this a provocation? Are you insulting his strength? Being kind? Trying to get him disciplined for something to make you go farther than you should? Are you planning to file a complaint? Create trouble? From a situation of servile impressment, you have once more seized the initiative. You have taken back the power of choice. The soldier is thrown off balance by being deprived of the predictability of your response. He has never dealt with such a problem before. Now you have forced him into making a decision for which nothing in his previous experience has prepared him. If he has enjoyed feeling superior to the vanquished, he will not enjoy it today. Imagine the hilarious situation of a Roman infantryman pleading with a Jew, Oh, come on, please give me back my pack. The humor of this scene may escape those who picture it through sanctimonious eyes, but it could scarcely have been lost on Jesus' hearers, who must have been regaled at the prospect of thus discomfiting their oppressors. Some readers may object to the idea of discomfiting the soldier or embarrassing the creditor, But can people who are engaged in oppressive acts repent unless they are made uncomfortable with their actions? There is admittedly the danger of using nonviolence as a tactic of revenge and humiliation. There is also, at the opposite extreme, an equal danger of sentimentality and softness that confuses the uncompromising love of Jesus with being nice. Loving confrontation can free both the oppressed from docility and the oppressor from sin. Even if nonviolent action does not immediately change the heart of the oppressor, it does affect those committed to it. As Martin Luther King Jr. attested, 
It gives them new self-respect and calls up resources of strength and courage they did not know they had. To those who have power, Jesus' advice to the powerless may seem paltry, but to those whose lifelong pattern has been to cringe, bow, and scrape before their masters, and who have internalized their role as inferiors, this small step is momentous. It is comparable to the attempt by black chairwomen in South Africa to join together in what would be, for some of them, an almost insuperable step, to begin calling their employers by their first names. These three examples amplify what Jesus means in his thesis statement, don't react violently against the one who is evil. Instead of the two options ingrained in us by millions of years of unreflective brute response to biological threats from the environment, fight or flight, Jesus offers a third way. This new way marks a historic mutation in human development, the revolt against the principle of natural selection. With Jesus, a way emerges by which evil can be opposed without being mirrored. Jesus' third way. Seize the moral initiative. Find a creative alternative to violence. Assert your own humanity and dignity as a person. Meet force with ridicule or humor. Break the cycle of humiliation. Refuse to submit or to accept the inferior position. Expose the injustice of the system. Take control of the power dynamic. Shame the oppressor into repentance. Stand your ground. Force the powers to make decisions for which they are not prepared. Recognize your own power. Be willing to suffer rather than to retaliate. Cause the oppressor to see you in a new light. Deprive the oppressor of a situation where a show of force is effective. Be willing to undergo the penalty for breaking unjust laws. Die to fear of the old order and its rules. Compare this to flight, which leads to submission, passivity, withdrawal, or surrender. Or to fight, armed revolt, a violent rebellion, direct retaliation, revenge. It is too bad that Jesus did not provide 15 or 20 further examples since we do not tend towards this new response naturally. Some examples from political history might help engrave it more deeply in our minds. In Alagamar, Brazil, a group of peasants organized a long-term struggle to preserve their lands against attempts at illegal expropriation by national and international firms, with the connivance of local politicians in the military. Some of the peasants were arrested and jailed in town. Their companions decided they were all equally responsible, so hundreds marched to the town and filled the house of the judge, demanding to be jailed with those who had been arrested. The judge was finally obliged to send them all home, including the prisoners. Another one that Jesus himself must have known, and that may have served as a model for his examples. In 26 CE, when Pontius Pilate brought the imperial standards into Jerusalem and displayed them at the fortress Antonio, overlooking the temple, all Jerusalem was thrown into a tumult. These effigies of Caesar that are called standards not only infringed on the commandment against images, but were the particular gods of the legions. Jewish leaders requested their removal. When Pilate refused, a large crowd of Jews fell prostrate around uh, for five whole days and nights, and remained motionless in that position. On the sixth day, Pilate assembled the multitude in the stadium with the apparent intention of answering them. Instead, his soldiers surrounded the Jews in a ring three deep. As Josephus tells it, Pilate, after threatening to cut them down if they refused to admit Caesar's images, signaled to the soldiers to draw their swords. Thereupon the Jews, as by concerted action, flung themselves in a body on the ground, extended their necks and exclaimed that they were ready rather to die than to transgress the law. Overcome with astonishment at such intense religious zeal, Pilate gave orders for the immediate removal of the standards from Jerusalem. About 150 village women shut down most of a multinational oil company's operations in Nigeria for nearly a week. They commandeered a Chevron Texaco staff ferry to sneak into the company's Escravos pipeline terminal. The unarmed women continued to occupy the terminal, stopping exports and trapping about 700 workers inside. The women wanted jobs for their sons and electricity in their impoverished homes. In this, the world's sixth largest oil exporter nation. When planes would land, the women would surround them so they couldn't take off again. Other teams of women shut down the docks and helicopter pads. Poorest of the poor, these mothers discovered the power of numbers. 
and, as of this writing, still had the upper hand. Here's an example that deals with the perennial problem of bullying as told by the mother in one of our workshops. Her son was the smallest kid in his class, and he was afflicted with chronic sinusitis. On his school bus, there was a bully who was terrorizing all the kids. Finally, one day, the boy had had it with the bully. He blew his nose into the right hand, then walked towards the bully, extended his hand, and sang, I've always wanted to shake the hand of a real bully. The bully began to back up to the back of the bus, where he meekly sat down and never bothered anyone on the bus again, because that nose was always at the ready. What I like about this story is the way the boy used his weakness as a strength. Just as Jesus taught, he took the momentum of evil and used it to throw his opponent. The nurses in a hospital in Saskatchewan were tired of being browbeaten, corrected in front of patients, and generally made to feel inferior by the doctors on staff. The nurses put their heads together and came up with a plan. They went to a sympathetic administration and set up a pink alert, which would be transmitted over the intercom the next time a doctor started abusing a nurse. From all over the hospital, nurses who were free converged on the scene, surrounded the doctor, holding hands, and waited for him to make the first move. He located the smallest nurse and plunged towards her, but the circle merely gave with his charge. He tried another nurse. Same result. It became like the childhood game Red Rover. The circle was like an amoeba that simply gave with with his every move. Finally, he dropped his hands, acquiescing in their lesson. That pretty much took care of that problem from then on, for the circle, like the boy's nose, was ready at a moment's notice. It is important to repeat such stories in order to extend our imaginations for creative nonviolence. Since it is not natural response, we need to be schooled in it. We need models, and we need to rehearse it in our daily lives if we ever hope to resort to it in crises. Sadly, Jesus' three examples have been turned into laws with no reference to the utterly changed context in which they were being applied. His attempts to nerve the powerless to assert their humanity under inhuman conditions has been turned into a legalistic prohibition on schoolyard fistfights between peers. Pacifists and those who reject pacifism alike have tended to regard Jesus' infinitely malleable insights as iron rules, the one group urging that they be observed inflexibly the other treating them as impossible demands intended to break us and catapult us into the arms of grace. The creative, ironic, playful quality of Jesus' teachings has thus been buried under the avalanche of humorless commentary. And as always, law kills. How many a battered wife has been counseled on the strength of a legalistic reading of this passage to turn the other cheek? when what she needs, according to the spirit of Jesus' words, is to find a way to restore her own dignity and end the vicious circle of humiliation, guilt, and bruising. She needs to assert some sort of control in the situation and force her husband to regard her as an equal, or get out of the relationship altogether. The victim needs to recover her self-worth and seize the initiative from her oppressor, and he needs to be helped to overcome his violence. The most creative and loving thing she could do at least in the American setting, might be to have him arrested. Turn the other cheek is not intended as a legal requirement to be applied woodenly in every situation, but as the impetus for discovering creative alternatives that transcend the only two that we are conditioned to perceive, submission or violence, flight or fight. Shortly after I was promoted from the B team to the varsity basketball squad in high school, I noticed that Ernie, the captain, was missing shot after shot from the corner because he was firing it like a bullet. So, helpfully, I thought, I shouted, Arch it, Ernie, arch it! His best friend, Ham, thought advice from a greenhorn impertinent, and from that day on, verbally sniped at me without let-up. I had been raised a Christian, so I turned the other cheek. To each sarcastic jibe, I answered with a smile or soft words. This confused Ham somewhat. By the end of the season, he lost his taste for taunts. It was not until four years later that I suddenly woke to the realization that I had not loved Ham into changing. The fact was I hated his guts. It might have been far more creative for me to have challenged him to a fist fight. Then he would have had to deal with me as an equal. But I was afraid to fight him, though the fight would probably have been a draw. I was scared that I might get hurt. I was hiding behind the Christian injunction to turn the other cheek rather than asking, 
what is the most creative, transformative response to this situation? Perhaps I had done the right thing for the wrong reason, but I suspect that creative nonviolence can never be a genuinely moral response unless we are capable of first entertaining the possibility of violence and consciously saying no. Otherwise, our nonviolence may actually be a mask for cowardice, as it most certainly was for me. The oppressed of the third world are justifiably suspicious that we of the first world are more concerned with avoiding violence than with realizing justice. Nobel Peace Prize laureate Adolfo Perez Esquivel comments, What has always caught my attention is that the attitude of the peace movement in Europe and the United States, where nonviolence is envisioned as the final objective. Nonviolence is not the final objective. Nonviolence is a lifestyle. The final objective is humanity. It is life. I know this season is a season on uh, some of the, the works that I consider you know, great works. And of course, there are a lot that I'm not really able to get to because of copyright reasons and, and uh, other stuff. Um, but I really love this work by Walter Wink for, for a number of reasons. And, um, you know, one of the, the first reason that I really love this book is because I think he captures the heart of true Christian nonviolence, which is, um, you know, so often, especially secular nonviolence, but even for Christians, it's easy to, to turn nonviolence into this strategy that you implement. And King and others talk about how it can't really be a strategy. Like if it's a strategy, people are going to see right through that. And it's not going to have the impact that, um, that really you want it to have. But, you know, ironically, it's not, you can't focus on the impact you want it to have because then it becomes a strategy, a, a tool that you're, you're trying to use to manipulate other people. And Wink, like you can tell throughout this that he has a genuine concern, not only for the oppressed, like, of course, for the oppressed, but also for the oppressor. Um, you know, he, he says, uh, like, loving confrontation can free both the oppressed from docility and the oppressor from sin. And that's beautiful to, to legitimately care about the oppressor, because as Christians, we believe that oppressors are themselves oppressed by their sin. Like, sin is slavery, and we, through circumstances and choices, like we become oppressed by sin, and we should want to free all parties, because that's what peace is. Um, peace is not sticking it to the oppressor and making them humiliated and all that kind of stuff. That's just going to create a, a cycle of violence, okay? It's, it's not physical violence against them, but to humiliate them is really to, um, you know, do damage to them. And, um, and so that can't be our goal. Our goal has to be the love of both. But of course, we, we want for the oppressed to be able to come out from under their oppression uh, because the oppressors are in the wrong. Nevertheless, we still want the oppressor to, to uh, come out from under their oppression as well. Um, and, and one of the ways that Wink says this that I think is just so beautiful is he says that, uh, can people engaged in oppressive acts repent if not made uncomfortable in their actions. He recognizes the, uh, the entrapment of sin. He recognizes that, uh, that the oppressors are, are themselves blind in their sin a lot of times. And part of what he's arguing is that, look, nonviolence, sure, you can go up and, and hurt your oppressor, Okay, you can get a bunch of people to go and overthrow them or, or whatever. If you can do that, like, that's hard to do. But if you can do that, yeah, you can do that. But now the oppressor, if, if he's still alive, is going to be biding his time and trying to figure out how to get back at you. And it doesn't really free them from anything. It doesn't really bring shalom. It doesn't bring peace to the situation. It's this cycle of violence, tit for tat, back and forth. Um, and so he says, look, this, this nonviolence, this third way that he calls it, Part of, uh, part of the way that that works is that we're not just running away and leaving the oppressor in their sin and the oppressed in their oppression, and we're not fighting back just basically, you know, a, a lot of, um, you know, I've talked about CRT a bit and how I, I think there are a lot of good things about it, the way that it can identify some things, uh, some truths about the world, but its solution is essentially to change the oppressor, change the, the group in power. 
Well, that's uh, Wink says that's what fighting does. You know, fighting, humiliation, whatever. We don't want to just switch the people in power. That is not peace. And uh, so, what this nonviolence does, what this third way does, is it is creative in the way that it gets um, the the oppressor kind of back on their feet and to to consider what it is that they're doing, who they are, who they're doing, uh, who they're oppressing, who they're doing evil towards, and. Maybe nothing will come of it, but if if the oppressor is going to have any chance at all to repent from their sin, which is the goal here for our enemy, is their repentance. Uh, if that's going to happen, they the best chance of that happening is for them to um, to feel off balance, like to to be shocked by something, uh, to be made uncomfortable in their actions, and if that's our goal our enemy's well-being, then uh, it, it makes it easier to implement nonviolence too because we're not doing it to just get our way, to get us or our friends out from under oppression. We're doing it out of love for our enemy too. And so true nonviolence cannot be done without true enemy love. So that's the first thing I love uh, about this. The second thing I love about uh, Wink, and he talks about this, he deals with this more elsewhere. I think he even has like a book called Unmasking the Powers or something. Um, but he talks about unmasking here, how what nonviolence does is it it unmasks what's going on. It unmasks injustice. It unmasks oppression. It lays bare the truth. And we've talked about this a lot in our, our season on nonviolence as well as our season on nonviolent action how uh and and one of the best examples you know Gandhi's salt march but for us here in the states one of the best examples would be um Selma or um you know when when uh during the civil rights movement when the police force was water hosing children and like sending dogs to attack you see that and all of a sudden uh when you have all these people who aren't fighting and you have dogs sicked on them or water hoses just blasting them across the street it's like Oh, you know, I I can't really support the police here or the South or Jim Crow. I can't really just, you know, support that ideologically because it was an it was this nice, maybe it was this okay idea in my head. Sure, let the South do their thing, you know, the police, we gotta give them our our trust and you know, the government knows what they're doing. No, when when you see what ha- what's happening, you can't deceive yourself in your head anymore. It's reality is laid bare in front of you, and it's it's made clear. Now, unfortunately, with our uh, news coverage, you know, I'm thinking about I'm recording this um, several months into Israel and and Gaza, Gaza's conflict, and um, yeah, I I think reality is laid very bare right there um, with the starvation, the the children dying, just the Ten more than ten thousand. Like I think we're at like fifteen thousand kids killed or something close to that at this point. Like reality is laid bare, and what's what's horrendous is that it seems like even with having this stuff blasted across our our uh, screens, um, people are becoming more and more calloused to reality or denying of reality. Nevertheless, um, wink. I think highlights this idea of nonviolence as unmasking, which is uh, the goal for things. You know, uh, what's his name? Aaron Bushnell. I think it was like a week or two ago. Um, he self-immolated for Gaza, and uh, so this uh, this Air Force American Air Force guy who did this. And initially, you're like, what does that do? Like, what is what does self-immolation do? How does that bring about any good? I'm not saying that self-immolation is good. Uh, I I don't think that that's a, a positive. I don't think that that is overall a, a an appropriate Christian way to go about things. But in terms of nonviolence and shocking the senses, for somebody to do that to themselves, to knowingly do that to themselves, and to undergo that pain for a cause, that shows you that they really, really believe. Uh, what they're doing. Uh, they believe in that cause, and it shocks the senses. Now, of course, you can write that, that individual off as crazy or 
convinced. And of course, most people are writing him off as, as crazy. Now, just because he's convinced doesn't mean he's right. But, uh, you know, I, I struggle just, uh, I've been taking cold showers for a while. I struggle just to turn the cold water on. I can't imagine self-immolating. Like, he is convinced. He might not be right, but uh, it, it should shock the senses. But we are, we are very calloused to those sorts of things at this point. Um, so unmasking, that's a, a big Walter Wink thing, and I think it's something that is uh, spot on in terms of nonviolence. Then the third main thing is a lot of what Wink talks about is how nonviolence is active. It is not passive. And that's very important to understand. It's a common misconception about pacifism. Um, but I don't think it's really a misconception. I think it's a mischaracterization uh, a lot of times due to willful ignorance because there's enough out there on nonviolence and stuff that... Um, People should not mistake pacifism for passivism. Uh, finally, one of the things that I, I really love about this piece is that Wink talks about how really there's a lot of pacifism that is legalism, that isn't good, just making laws out of Jesus' commands, and, which is really a way to avoid the third way. Okay, non Nonviolence isn't the third way per se because... Uh, you can use nonviolence to say, well, you know, I, I can't engage in that conflict. I'm nonviolent. I'm just not going to attack. I'm just going to submit, which is, uh, you know, hardening up into a, a ball like an armadillo or a hedgehog. You know, that's that's not really engaging, right? That's still, uh, it's, it's sort of like flight. It's not really doing any good. And Wink is like, no, we can't be legalistic about this stuff. He said, what I did it, when I was uh, on varsity basketball, he's like, okay, I didn't engage in violence, but he said, you know what? Violence might have actually been more creative and done better for my enemy than what I just did to kind of hate his guts and sit there and not confront him, right? Uh, even though he, he dealt with it head on in a way, just absorbing the blows, but he he did it um, with hatred in his heart and without bringing his enemy to the uh, to be confronted with his wrongdoing. And I, I absolutely love that aspect about Wink, where he says, look, we, ha we have to face the choice of violence and say no, and then choose to do something active. Uh, we can't just say no to violence because that ends up being passive. And so he's critical of, uh, of those within his own pacifist community who are not really choosing the third way. And of course, you know, this idea of the third way is really where uh, the name for this podcast came out of. It's from, from this article. Uh, when I was talking with a bunch of other pacifists and we were trying to come up with a name for, uh, for this podcast, um, we talked about the third way. And I was like, well, I don't really want to take that because that's, you know, Walter Winks. And there, there was also a, uh, another podcast I found out later called The Third Way, so I'm glad I didn't take it. But uh, somebody was saying, well, you know, really, you've got fight, flight, and then there's, there's freeze. They identified this kind of third category because um, there are times when you just freeze up in, um, in extreme circumstances. And so the fourth way is avoiding all three of those. Um, I guess they aren't poles if there are three of them, but whatever, all three of those extremes. And the fourth way is, uh, is kind of centering that and choosing creative non-resistance. So I highly recommend this work by Wink. And I've, I've honestly never read the whole work. And I don't think I've actually ever read any of Walter Wink's books in and of themselves. So I think I would recommend him. I've, I've liked the uh, snippets that I've gotten from him and this article a lot. But I at least recommend um, this, this chapter of this book and probably the whole book. That's all for now. So peace, and because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it. This podcast is a part of the Kingdom Outpost Network. Please check out the links below 
to find other great podcasts and content related to nonviolence and kingdom living.